Thank you very much for attending our presentation this morning. Um, if I could personally say it's been a pleasure collaborating with Silvana throughout this year, putting together this, uh, in our humble opinion, amazing white paper <laughs> under the leadership of Karen Momba here. Uh, and what we want to achieve today is something very simple. We want, first of all, to define professional development, give a definition contextualized to our field. We want to explain to you why evidence-informed professional development is what we should pursue. And there we have evidence uh, for that. <laughs> then we want to spot a few features of what the evidence says effective professional development should do, and looking at dimensions Finally, giving you two concrete examples that you can take to your institutions and implement next Monday morning? <laughs> Not. <clears throat> so let's start, let's kick off. Defining professional development. In our profession, like other professions, professional development is not seen as something that teachers should do. And we define it as a career-long process. You start your teacher training, you start professional development, you go to your grave, and hopefully you'll have, he was a member of the TD Sega Tai Tefl, right? <coughs> Something like that. And what's the purpose of that? We have very different students in every group, in every course, so we need to hone our skills, our dispositions, and our knowledge. For what purpose? to serve our students better. Our reason for being is the students. So here is where evidence is important. We should affect students' learning. Thank you. Hello. So um, I'm going to move on to why evidence-informed professional development. As you all know, planning, delivering, participating in, evaluating, Continuous professional development programs require a significant investment in time, resources, <coughs> commitment from everybody involved, the teachers, the CPD providers, their managers, the teachers' families, etc. Um, and interestingly enough, unfortunately, not all CPD activities, not all CPD initiatives are equally effective. In fact, when you review the literature, and I'm sure you're all aware from your own experience, that there is a lot of ineffective continuous professional development around. And a lot of the time, the reasons for this is that um, it doesn't really go much beyond providing the teachers with input. In, in a lot of the cases, it stops there. And it doesn't give the teachers the support, the follow-up, everything they need to make those changes to their practice that leads uh, to improve learner outcomes. And also, I think an important thing to consider is that not all CPD materials can be considered reliable. If we think of the wonderful massive changes in technology that we have witnessed over the last few decades, that has led to a profusion of materials, which is clearly very beneficial to many teachers. You know, if you think about teachers before that not having access uh, to a lot of materials that were expensive, that's great. Um, you know, we think now of social media, uh, webinars, you know, all that kind of scenario as the new normal, and that's really great. However, that is also problematic for teachers, for their managers, um, for teacher educators, etc., in the sense that that profusion of teacher-generated materials is not always um, peer edited, and we don't always have the rigor of the editorial process. So sometimes it's very difficult to navigate a sea of variable quality. So that's why um, grounding ourselves in evidence is really, really important. But the most important thing, as Gabriel said, it's we are dealing with the future of our learners and access to life and work, etc. So I don't want to waste time in things that I have no idea whether they work or not. As a leader of CPD, I want to know in my organization, or in, you know, if I work for a state sector, etc., that the investment that I make really pays off in impactful learning for the teachers, so that in turn it results in impactful learning for the learners. So a key question that anybody managing, leading, or providing CPD needs to ask themselves is, what types of CPD initiatives result in better learning, and not just for the teachers, but more importantly, for the learners that those teachers teach? 
So now I'm going to move on to uh, what the literature... It's interesting because, <clears throat> unlike many other areas of research, when you look at the evidence, and I'm not just talking about one little study, we're talking about meta-analysis, so, you know, massive amounts of research um, summarized and reviewed. This particular area is in total agreement. You know, everybody coincides that these are the design features of continuous professional development programs that do make a difference and result in impactful, long-lasting, powerful teacher learning. So very important for us to consider them. So that you remember, uh, we are using the word inspire and using each letter of the word inspire as the initial of the main features of impactful continuous professional development. So I, I'm, I'm going to tell you first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about each. So I stands for impact. N stands for needs-based. S, sustained. P for peer collaborative. I for in practice. R for reflective and E for evaluated. So let's start with I for impact. And this means, as Gabriel said before, <coughs> that the main goal of continuous professional development for teachers is to effect changes in their teaching, not just to make their teaching funnier <laughs> or more in, you know, for edutainment, but so that it results in enhanced students' learning. It's about better learning. And the evidence overwhelmingly says that when you develop teachers' ability to teach well, it makes not just a little difference, a significant difference to students' progress and leads to improved learning outcomes. In other words, excellence in teaching unlocks better learning. How do we achieve impact? This is not something that a teacher in her own classroom can achieve by him or herself. This is something that leaders of CPD and leaders of learning need to be very engaged in. So first of all, it's about creating and sharing and sustaining a vision that, you know, improved learner outcomes, that better learning for the learners in our organization is something we want, is something desirable, and that we're going to work hard for it. The second stage is for learners and teachers working together to understand what changes we need to make in the student's learning and therefore in the teacher's learning and in the teacher's practice to make those changes happen and those imp that improvement happen. And that means really getting very dirty, trying to understand what the impactful strategies to make that happen are and to work on those. And as we work on those, to analyze them and to evaluate them. N for needs-based. And we all know that one size does not fit all, and that, of course, impactful, effective professional development needs to cater for each individual teacher's needs. And the most obvious example is the needs of a, of a teacher, a newly qualified teacher at the start of their career, are terribly different from the needs of a teacher who, for example, is interested in moving to becoming a teacher of teachers. So, important, and, and the literature again concurs, that, you know, effective professional development does take into account the needs of the students and their learners. But also, I think a lot of professional development starts and ends just by considering the needs of the teacher. And things like, how can I engage teachers? How can I motivate teachers? How can I get them to come to the inset sessions? Now, and that is okay, it's necessary, but not sufficient. It's only the beginning. Of course, the most important thing is to consider what are those learners in need of? What are their learning needs? And that will inform what the teachers need to learn. But also, more importantly, these are the bigger ones. Um, what are the social, political, educational, and cultural contexts in which those, you know, Teacher learning is a situated phenomenon. It happens in a concrete environment with specific features. And if, if this is so important, for example, you know, for the parachutist, teacher educator flown over to impart their wisdom in different contexts, we need to have a very good understanding of what that context is, 
what it looks like, what works and what doesn't. If not, whatever improvement I, I want to impart onto people is going to fall flat. Also, um, a consideration of the institutional needs and culture. Uh, just to give you an example, um, if the institution is a very vertical, top-down institution, and then suddenly I suggest in, you know, making a change to the way teachers learn, and let's go for peer observation, and peer this, and peer that, and self-directed, if we don't look at what the culture is used to doing, and we don't consider very carefully how to help that culture get into this ambitious and wonderful model of peer collaboration, it's not going to happen. And what is feasible? What is practical? And again, um, <clears throat> examples of, for example, you know, whole countries going for educational reform and ambitious projects where teachers are asked to learn online and the country has 20% of households with Wi-Fi. How is that going to work? So these things are so important and sometimes overlooked. So the key question here is what works in this context for these learners, teachers, and leaders at this point in time. Now, sustained, the last one. And the last one, very short for me. Sustained. Sustained has got two dimensions. One is the idea of sustained over time. So the idea, and again, the literature is very consistent on this, that the one of session and the short course is not going to deliver, is not effective in creating the necessary conditions for the changes that teachers need in their cognition, but also in their practice. It doesn't work. So to be impactful, a CPD program needs to be prolonged. The second dimension of sustained is that it, it needs support and it needs follow-up. We need to hold, not just drop. Okay, and we come to the issue of peer collaboration. You know, when, whenever we talk about peer collaboration, maybe to many of you the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of a community of practice. Now, communities of practice have become literalized in our field. And uh, we do something online, oh, we're a community. Not necessarily so. We have to realize that communities can be set up around a convening activity. And that doesn't mean that that community will be everlasting. Communities can be ad, set up ad hoc to cater for specific professional needs. And one thing that we would like to emphasize about this INSPIRE model is that this is a systemic view of professional development and not a piecemeal view. Unless all the conditions are met, the impact on student learning is not going to be seen. So here we are talking about colleagues learning from colleagues, but in a principled way. What do you get from your colleagues? Well, Silvana was talking about uh, the need for professional development to be sustained over time and have some support. We all have experts in our institutions who can act as mentors, as guides, as coaches, if need be. So you get regular support and feedback from your peers. For that, you need to create this, the space so that, so that teachers can work freely and uh, collaboratively uh, amongst themselves. <clears throat> and what is the focus? What is the convening activity in that community? Well, basically, we all face day-to-day -day problems. I don't like to call them problems, but like critical moments in our performance as educators. So we focus on those, and together with other people in this particular context, we crack the code of how to work for our students in our institution. And of course, for that, you need to allow space for teachers to do it. Much professional development, as we have experienced it, and we, uh, many of our colleagues experience it, is still chalk and talk. Oh, we have this professional development day. We have the experts who come and tell us what we should do, even though they've never been to our institution and they don't know us. And <clears throat> then they say, go forth and do it. But how? Professional development to work needs to be done in practice. 
It includes a classroom-based focus on teaching practice. Remember that we kind of talk about the teaching learning process because one does not necessarily need lead to the other. However, research is conclusive that when you have good teachers, you, have, you stand to have more chances of having good learning. So what we look for here is how teachers engage in looking at the theory so that they can practice it, but in doing so, they begin to theorize their own practice in the <coughs> contextual manner we were talking about. <coughs> so the idea is this, teachers learning through doing, tackling real issues, issues that are issues for the institution and for the students now, and developing practical solutions. And of course, when you engage in a process like this, you will reflect, even if you don't want to, right? The, the conditions will force you to reflect. And when we talk about reflection, we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about domains of reflection. And as we said, we're focused on concerns about practice, doing inquiry, <coughs> looking at change, how can inquiry change uh, the conditions now? And <clears throat> there are different levels of reflection. And here we're quoting uh, a, a more renewed view than that of Zeigner in the 90s. We, you can have routine reflection. That is what I do when I plan. I plan my lesson, I'm reflecting on uh, my teaching. There's technical reflection. Sometimes the problem is that I cannot manage a certain particular um, uh, teaching procedure, there can be dialogic reflection, and this is what happens in communities of practice, when teachers talk to each other, and eventually we want to attain this kind of transformative reflection that leads the community to learn <coughs> and in so doing develop. But for that to happen, we also need to evaluate everything that we do. And it's not just the uh, usual uh, form, like did you like the coffee breaks, were the facilities nice? No. The measuring stick here is, are students learning better? Are students, and I'm not talking about learning results as measured by tests, because that is test results, that's not learning. Are students able to participate more in activities involving English, which is what we want them to do? Are they better at reading? They, do they understand more? Do they talk more? Right? And of course, <coughs> for that to happen, the institution has to support, and this is our uh, shout out to administrators, allow for evaluation of the impact of professional development and do not correlate teacher performance to student learning results. Right? In short, isn't it ironic that if you've been to, the, to, to many talks, you have heard about how important it is to differentiate instruction, to give each student what they need. And when it comes to teachers, we don't afford them that chance. So I concur with Andy Hargraves, of all people, that what we want for our students, we should want for our teachers. And what we want for them is learning, challenge, support, and more importantly, respect. So now I'm going to move on to dimensions on professional development. And of course, <clears throat> when you're planning um, CPD at a systemic level, there's always planning at institutional level. So what do all the teachers need to be able to do well or better um, to, to achieve improved student learning? And I think increasingly, because we have been much more aware as a profession that professional development has to be differentiated. I think there's some awareness of how to provide or create conditions for individual teachers to grow and develop. But sometimes what we miss is the one in the middle, um, you know, the needs of specific groups of teachers within our organization, and this is equally important. And just to give examples, you know, there will be some teachers within the same school that might be teaching young learners or um, adults, or there might be teachers uh, teaching for exam classes. This is a very obvious and basic example. But how is our professional development program catering and nourishing and generating the next, prof the next generation of those teachers? Are we actually looking, every time we plan CPD, how do we address you know, the, the goals of the whole organization where we all need to get better at and we're all learning 
Are we looking at what specific groups of teachers are trying to achieve and, and, and improve? And are we looking at how we are providing uh, channels and spaces for individual teachers to grow? So now we, we want to move on to the last uh, part of our talk to give you just two very, if you like, concrete case studies of, of initiatives that we have done that have really uh, made um, an impact in our organization. So, Gabo. As Shinad very fluently said, I'm director of the, uh, I'm director of the Ludus Center. That's, uh, uh, Ludus is where the gladiators prepared for battle. That's the metaphor we are using. I hate it, but that is what the president of my university likes. But it's true, it's a center where teachers who have been systematically evaluated by their students and their administrators as underperforming can be given a chance to gain the skills, knowledge, and dispositions needed to succeed in promoting quality student learning. And the first thing that happens is my, the teachers I work with are all professionals. They are dentists, doctors, lawyers, accountants who have their own practices. And they always say, oh, I don't have time for professional development. So we had to create something that would uh, encourage them to interact. And we did it online. We used an, a strategy called le learning circles. And you will see how everything, is, uh, cor everything corresponds to our inspired uh, metaphor. There's a, a getting ready phase. So the first thing was, I met with the teachers, I said, they had already spoken with their deans, their deans told them you are underperforming, this is the first time we're considering letting you go. In the getting ready phase, I had to say, okay, but here's our deal, we are giving you the tools and the time to engage in something that may help you improve. So the first thing is we looked at specific needs. There were teachers, for example, who had huge issues with assessment. Typical thing, they evaluated through multiple choice, and the students never knew because they were proficient in doing multiple choice. One had two correct answers, the other one three, the other one four, the other one none. They used every single violation to item writing that you can think of, right? Uh, yeah, I'm actually using that in an assessment course now, <laughs> some of the bad examples. Um, <clears throat> So we looked at that and said, okay, I gave them a test which was like that, right? That was the getting ready, shock. If you want, you, they went online and did it, they said, oh no, but that's not fair, okay. When they spotted the problem, I invited one of the teachers, I nudged that teacher and said, okay, why don't you lead, what, what do you guys think should be done? From there, they started to plan a project. And I was just a lurker online. I was just there for support. I communicated with them not through the forums, but through individual messaging. Messaging, I'm saying that right? Yeah. <clears throat> the idea was that at the end of this six-week intervention, they were going to present in their respective schools something about evaluation to their peers. Notice that they were the most underperforming teachers. <clears throat> well, and basically, they ended up, we use a Padlet, you know Padlet? And they use that to present their findings as a team. And this is a strategy that is very cheap. It requires no cost. Teachers can do it in their free time. And if you look at the impact, it covers all bases. Thank you. Sorry, we're rushing. Okay. We're okay. Um, I want to share with you an intervention, we, an approach to teacher research. Some people call it a mini action research, because it's not that ambitious, called supported experiments. And at Bell, uh, we, I decided that we would be trying this, because um, I had very ta a group of very talented, very experienced, very motivated teachers. But some of, I heard the niggling comment of, I'm not the academic sort. I don't do research, and feeling very um, off, you know, they found research quite off-putting. Um, so I felt, you know, for us, a key goal was to help teachers become content creators and knowledge creators, producing the content relevant knowledge. Uh, and that you need to, for that, you need to engage in teacher research, but you need to start small and in a way that engages people and gets and generates buy in. So, this is a very concrete approach where you start um, encouraging teachers to explore their own context and issues around their context or things they're interested, puzzles, etc. So um, then after that, they look at what, what else is there? What other alternatives? What strategies? Ideally, evidence-informed strategies that could help um, work in a different way. 
and maybe address, maybe not, we don't know. We never know, it's just a journey. After that, it, that exploration of the current practice, sorry, I forgot about the current practice, so ha, sorry. Current practice is what they do already, then they explore the pedagogy. And then once they've explored the pedagogy, um, they ask themselves, okay, well, what am I gonna do? Now I know that I could do this and this and that. So what I'm actually going to do. So they plan the experiment, which involves what I'm going to do, with whom, for how long? Um, how am I going to gather data that this is having an impact on my learners, that it's improving their learning outcomes? And how am I gonna evaluate that? Um, after that, they carry the supported experiment and notice that it's supported. It's this idea that we were talking before of sustaining, of supporting, of following up. So always in dialogue, in peer collaboration with a colleague who acts as the sounding board, sometimes gives a bit of advice, sometimes just listens. Um, and the key here in supported experiments is deliberate practice, repeating, because practice makes better, but informed and critical practice, not just doing the same thing three times, but at each cycle, trying to understand what worked and what didn't, what do I have to tweak, how can I do this even better? And when the teachers are satisfied that they've had, you know, that, that, that's it, okay, I'm ready to share with my colleagues. This is about systemic change, so it's not just about my little context and my little classroom, but I'm sharing this with my colleagues, and ideally, when other colleagues adopt this and we adopt it as an organization, it becomes embedded practice. Just some examples before I, I stop. Um, these are just a, a few examples of experiments that teachers in our organization have done. So for example, one I, I want to draw your attention to, um, a colleague of mine recently did an experiment on Wii video, which is sc screencasting, and look at her question, her research question, is not about how can I use Wii video, or how can I make it more engaging? It's about to what extent does screencasting enhance speaking practice? So how is it making speaking better for my learners? Um, so just to, to begin to summarize and to close, uh, this is a quote from Robinson, and it's again this idea of impact. Time spent on effective professional development not only improves student outcomes and teacher morale, of course, it makes you more comfortable, it makes you more knowledgeable, uh, but also disproportionately benefits weaker students and empowers teachers to do more to raise their own levels of skill. So two closing messages for you here. Number one, organizations that think that um, professional development is a waste of time, or it's a luxury, or I have no time for this, um, are at risk. In this time of high stakes, competition, cuts to educational budgets, the key investment is professional development. And also, as we said before, excellence in teaching leads to excellence in learning, and the only way organizations can provide this is to give their teaching teams the space, the time, the support, and the resources that they need to get even better. And that doesn't mean spending huge, obscene amounts of money. It's just affording the teachers the space in their jobs to actually engage in that. Yeah. So, um, at, on the way out, um, you will have a paper copy of our new white paper, Effective Professional Development, Principles and Best Practice, to which we haven't really done a lot of justice just by speaking to you Absolutely. for 30 minutes. But our extensive list of references is there, so our evidence base is there. We articulate the ideas much more clearly than in a hurry 30-minute presentation. And hopefully, uh, it also contains a wealth of examples that you can actually use. So, thank you very much for listening. And, yes. remember, <laughs> but more importantly, more importantly, more importantly. how about Yay. that? <laughs> Brighten up your day with a free ice cream, guys. Thank you, thank very, you very much, much for being thank here. You.